Tylius Troubles, Part 51 Sub Sigillo Confessionis Under the seal of confession, therefore to be kept secret. Near the city of Viadaza, in the rear gardens of the Palazzo Sabadia, at the close of autumn, 2402. Lector Bernardo could see that Lector Urquhart was ill at ease, being so stilted by the need to suppress some species of twitching affliction that he was forced to clasp his hands together tightly as if to hold himself in place. It made him appear furtive, although upon closer inspection his eyes suggested it was more a consequence of fear. Unlike Lector Bernardo, who wore the traditional vermilion robes of his office, Urquhart was dressed more humbly, in the kind of coarse woollen cassock favoured by the lowest orders of priesthood. Bernardo had not asked him why, assuming it was because Urquhart had lost his see when the city of Trantio fell, and so probably thought it either improper or unreasonable to don his robes of office. He had also shaved his beard. Each to his own, thought Bernardo, musing on the fact that when he had lost Viadaza, it never occurred to him to alter his own wardrobe. He had considered it an act of defiance to maintain his official trappings, for doing so showed he had refused to accept the enemy's claim of possession. There was little colour in the palatial gardens, it being so late in autumn, but a lay brother was busy tidying one of the circular beds of herbs. Bernardo was pleased to know that another part of Viadaza was rid of the stench of corruption and the lingering sense of horror thus recovering a sense of normality and peace. Apart from the lectors, the only others present were two armoured guards, who accompanied Bernardo everywhere now, his secretary, Father Piero, and one of his small staff of gnomish clerks. Urquhart, like so many others, had begun by asking when the archlector would order the army to march again. Then, again like so many others, he begged Bernardo to encourage the archlector to delay no longer. This surprised him, for he had expected the ruined lector to request a force be dispatched to recapture Trantio. Then again, he also knew Urquhart had been in conversation with the Disciplinati di Moor and the spiritual leaders of the several dedicant congregations. So it was possible that he had been won over by their fanatical fervour. If he had participated in the dedicant's self-administered scourging, then that might explain his tortured twitches. Yet... Urquhart's exaggeratedly nervous state suggested something else. The truth came to light when he spoke further, describing the flight from Trantio before its fall, his own weakness in the face of the ogre's advance and the impossible dilemma of choosing whether to go north with the few or south with the many. Having chosen north, for that was where the archlector was, he was then racked by guilt upon hearing of the terrible fate of those who did go south. Here, Urquhart's voice faltered, and he spoke more quietly. I know now that going north was another part of my penance. I should never have left Trantio, and only added insult to injury by doing so. Bernardo could not think what Urquhart meant by this last comment. Insult to injury implied two faults, and that therefore his abandonment of Trantio was not his only sin. But surely you see, brother said Bernardo, that without sufficient strength to defend the city, it would have been madness to stay. How can you accept blame for what was a necessary action, brought about by forces beyond our control? If you will not blame the ogres, and I cannot see why you do not lay this evil deed squarely upon their shoulders, then perhaps the blame lies more upon Duke Guidobaldo, for not providing sufficient forces to defend that which he himself had uh, so violently taken. When he took his prize, he should have accepted the responsibilities that came with it. No, I cannot blame the Duke, answered Urquhart. I bear the burden of sin. I should have accepted my punishment, and stayed regardless of the threat. My advice to you, if you will take it from such as myself, who promise so much to so little effect, is this. Do not leave Viadaza. You lost it once, and it has been returned to you. Be not so careless, nor regardless of Moore's will, to lose it again. Bernardo nodded. I do want to stay, and I have petitioned His Holiness to allow me to do so. But I doubt my wish will be granted, 
for the Archlector has left Remus to pursue Moore's will. Why should we not also be expected to go wheresoever we are needed? Still, I cannot see why you blame yourself, he added. This talk of punishment and multiple sins, we all make mistakes, for which we ought to be penitent, but to heap such blame upon yourself for acting as you thought best at the time, this I do not understand. I myself delayed giving support for the Verdazan Crusade, and although I did finally march with them, fighting upon the field at Pontremola, when I heard the city was lost to the armies of the undead, I did not return. It was not fear that prevented me, although I was afraid, but rather the knowledge that the city was already lost, and that my immediate return could not change that. Surely it was just the same with you. What great fault do you believe you bear? Lector Urquhart fixed Bernardo with an intent gaze, then his eyes unfocused, as if to look upon some imagined object. Might we take leave of the others, brother, to talk privately? Urquhart asked. Bernardo nodded his consent, gesturing to the guards and servants to wait. The two lectors then turned towards the grassy gap between the hedged enclosures, leading towards a statue of Mamidia in the centre of the gardens. They walked in silence until they reached the foot of the statue. No one could hear them now. I take it you're not offended by the statue, asked Bernardo, wondering if a man promoted to lectorship by Duke Guidobaldo might share the schismatic Pavone and Morite monotheism. Capoliccio, lector of Pavona itself, was very much a schismatic, and indeed was considered by many to be the highest authority within the sect. Urquhart shook his head in a manner that mirrored the twitches he had exhibited earlier. That is not my sin. I have never had Sagrinalian leanings, nor have I ever given the impression of doing so, not even to gain Duke Guidobaldo's favour. No, I gained his favour by other means. He fell silent and Bernardo knew he was preparing to give his confession. "'Go on,' said Bernardo, making the sign of Moore's blessing. "'Sub sigillo confessionis.' Once again, Urquhart's hands twisted together before his waist, as if each was trying to restrain the other. "'My sin was not schism, nor was it leaving Trantio. That was merely my failure to accept my penance. I should have stayed to be butchered by the brutes. Here,' Momentarily, he faltered again. Then, fixing Bernardo with his gaze, perhaps to make it clear that he was hiding nothing, that this was a full and frank confession, he continued. I was sent by the Archlector to correct Duke Guidobaldo, to deliver the edict for peace between all princes, to directly order him to cease his vainglorious war at a time when Great Italia was in need of defence against the true enemy. I personally swore to the Archlector that I would apply myself, body and soul, to the task, yet I was lured from that straight and true path by the offer of a gift of lectorship of the cruelly conquered city of Trantio. I grasped the tainted office with both hands, and even wrote to the Archlector to inform him how all that was done by both the Duke and myself was good, proper, and for the greater glory of more. I told His Holiness the Duke was a righteous lord, who had sacrificed his son for the good of the people of Trantio, and by removing the tyrant Garenzo, could now set about protecting them from the undead threat. I saw the letter, said Bernardo, remembering how at the time he had wondered if there was something more to the story, something that had not been said. He spoke sternly. Continue. From that time the knowledge that it was not truly so, that I had succumbed to greed and a lust for power, gnawed at me. And still, my own greed was so great that I lied to the Archlector. How so? Confess fully or not at all, for a partial account is tantamount to another lie. I told the Archlector that I arrived after the fall of the city, and so Duke Guidobaldo knew nothing of the holy edict ordering peace. That was my greatest lie, for I had arrived at Trantio two days before the assault. The Duke promised me the reward of high office to buy my silence. More than that, I promised to mislead the Archlector so that it would appear the Duke had completed his war before the inconvenient edict was shown to him. In that way, Duke Guidobaldo could regretfully explain that he had received the edict too late, through no fault of his own. This is the sin that makes him ashamed to wear his robes of office, thought Bernardo. When he looked at Urquhart, however, 
he could see there was yet more to know. He decided not to press his penitent further, for the man's agony was plain enough, and it was merely a matter of waiting. Even as I took up residence in the palace, it became plain that my sin had spawned more evil in its wake. When I asked what had become of Lector Silvestro, I was met first by silence, then later by the story of a mob who burst into the palace to murder him for being the friend of and counsellor to Prince Garenzo. But although there were plentiful signs of disturbance in the palace and everything of value had been stolen, I never found any of Silvestro's servants who had been present that day to witness the event. I cannot say what was done, but I wondered just who could possibly have goaded the mysterious mob to murder a priest of Moor, when all would surely know that they were damned for doing so. Then, just as I began to wonder if the Duke would allow the Charlian riders who had accompanied me from Remus to return there, knowing as they did that we had arrived before the final battle, I learned that their service also had been very conveniently bought. They were promised increased pay to enter Pavonan service. I spoke to Captain Presre, and he seemed blissfully unaware of the whole affair, either because he cared nothing for such things, or he cared too little to question the matter. He knew I was carrying the edict, but not its full nature, nor what I had written in return. But worse, much worse, was yet to come. I had a suspicion, enough to be concerned, yet I did nothing to prevent it. My sins were multiplying, and I was becoming crushed under the weight of them. Although I had allowed my silence to be bought, another priest emissary, Father Franco de Pistoni, had of course been carrying the edict to Prince Girenzo of Trantio. The archlector had sent priests with letters to every Tylian prince and ruler. Father Franco had been unable to enter the city because of the besieging Pavonan army, and must surely have known that I too had arrived before Duke Guidobaldo ordered the assault. I was afraid he might return to the archlector to reveal the truth, and in my weakness I expressed this fear to the Duke. Bernardo was beginning to comprehend the full horror of what had been done, yet he still hoped that it might not be true. I heard that Father Franco was killed by brigands, a party of Compagno del Sole soldiers fleeing from the Battle of the Princes, who were later killed by Pavonan soldiers for their crime. Yes, the murderers were killed, and without trial, said Urquhart, three days after I spoke to the Duke of my concerns. Do you know whether the murderers were in fact Compagno men? asked Bernardo. Perhaps, but whoever they were, none could now reveal what really happened. Were they made to do it? Ordered? Tricked? And if they were not companion men, who were they? Why did they so conveniently kill that particular priest when there's no sane Tylian alive who would not balk at committing such a heinous crime? But you have no certain proof of Pavonan wrongdoing, pondered Bernardo. Unless... Did you speak to Duke Guidobaldo about this? No, I confess I dare not do so. He would have thought it an implied accusation, and I was clinging to the hope that some greater good might result from my sins and the Duke's transgressions. Now that Trantio has fallen, I know that nothing good came of it, only righteous punishment. Bernardo was hesitant to answer immediately. He himself had shown frailty and bad judgment, but Urquhart had clearly gone much further, adding deliberate lies in the pursuit of personal ambition joining a corrupt game of worldly politicking, even lying to His Holiness, Calictus II himself. And yet, the war against the vampires was not yet won, and to reveal such secrets now could shatter the alliances of the Holy Army. Lord Silvano, Duke Guidobaldo's heir, served in the army itself, commanding several regiments. This consideration brought to mind the holy doctrine of double effect, which held that in pursuit of a greater good, then lesser evils were permissible. One could not, for example, win a just war without the risk of harming innocents along the way. To attempt to do so would be like fighting with one arm tied behind one's back. What Urquhart had done, his and Duke Guidobaldo's lies, the possibility of not one but several priestly assassinations, all this was very bad indeed. But right now, the balance lay between the victory in a holy war on one side and the failure to reveal past crimes on the other. The first need was great, the second could wait. He looked Urquhart in the eyes and began. 
Let us consider the matter, brother, in light of holy doctrine, and our present desperate need to prevail against a most wicked and dangerous foe.